Thanks very much. I'm very excited to be with you today. Uh, this is such a great place to be. Brought my kids here earlier this summer uh, to this very theater to watch the U2 3D movie. Uh, having just seen the, the last leg of the, the U2 tour in Pittsburgh last fall. So needless to say, I'm a huge U2 fan. But I suspect that I'm a little bit unusual in my musical taste, perhaps not in this room. Um, but uh, I've also played timpani in Mahler's first symphony on the stage of the Kennedy Center. Uh, as well as in a garage band in Tucson uh, for Rolling Stone's Brown Sugar. Uh, I uh, have on my iPod next to each other Dvorak's Seventh Symphony and Adele's 21. So um, all that to say that uh, my bachelor's is in uh, music history and literature from Youngstown State. And in addition to, to spending uh, all my professional time these days, thinking about social media and websites and how to do digital marketing. Uh, my heart is in uh, fine and performing arts. And uh, so I care very much about the successes of arts organizations in Northeast Ohio. And I'm, again, glad to be with you today and, and talk about how we can adapt what we're doing to this changing world. Let's see if I can figure out how to use this. There we go. Um, I like to start out uh, talks about social media with a quote from General Eric Shinseki. First of all, it just makes it sound really important. Uh, but, but this quote, if you don't like change, you're going to like relevance even less, I think takes on special importance uh, as we look at the events of this weekend, for example, when a man ascended to the very edge of space, stepped out of a capsule, and plunged to the ground, beating the, the, the sound barrier, and then parachuting to safety uh, on, on, on the earth and uh, amazing times that we live in. So at the same time that, that change is happening all around us in this room are, are some of the institutions that, that guard and promote heritage and the culture that we have enjoyed for so many hundreds of years. And how do we balance uh, our love for tradition and our classical heritage with the increasing distraction that we face in, in our culture every day. Um, and can you imagine the money that, that the sponsor of this mission yesterday, Red Bull, put into um, the marketing and, and promotion of this event? Meanwhile, orchestras around the country are shuttering in some cases or locking out their musicians and trying to figure out how to make their budget work for this season and coming seasons. So. There's clearly a disconnect between the, the popular media and the social media and, and how do we fit into that and uh, ensure that we're giving our existing supporters the day-to-day -day connection with the arts that they crave and also discovering new audiences that we need to continue our programs into the future. We know where they're hanging out. Uh, at One out of every eight minutes spent online is spent on Facebook. Uh, nearing a billion members, this is clearly the place that we need to crack. We need to figure out how to, how to really make an impact here. Um, but what may surprise you is that at the same time, we're seeing major websites getting more traffic from social networks than they've gotten from Google and from search. So people are spending more time on social networks than they are in search. And, and this suggests a, a change in how we market ourselves and how we think about digital marketing overall. Um, and in fact, uh, this week there was a report that the number of searches that are done through a desktop have, for the very first time since they've been measured, uh, decreased year over year. And what that means is not that people are no, no longer searching or are searching less, but they're doing so more on mobile. So then we have to also consider what people are doing on mobile devices. So these stats, and I'm, I'm providing you with a lot of stats because I know that there are still stakeholders in your organizations who are dragging their feet a bit maybe or doubting that, that, that social media is a place that they really want to go. They're, they're scared perhaps of the vulnerability that is suggested by that, by burying yourself in, in these public forums where people can talk back to you. Um, so I, I hope that this helps to arm you with the argument about uh, what we need to do in, in moving forward. So when we look at 
at the mobile activities, um, in addition to traditional mobile activities like texting, uh, playing on apps, we see that fully a third of mobile users spend time on social networking sites. And, and note that this includes non-smartphone mobile devices. So we can imagine that on the smartphone devices where they have easier access to social networking, they're doing it probably even more. So your audience isn't just hanging out on Facebook. Your connection with them is an opportunity to, for them to evangelize on your behalf. So what we want to do is give them the social objects and that they really like and are proud of in, in terms of their relationship with your organization so that they want to share that with their friends. And this is what is happening is 38% of people who have liked a brand are talking about it or recommending it to their friends. They're saying, go to the Cleveland Orchestra this weekend and see Alexander Nevsky. They're saying, go and see the Impressionism exhibit at the Cleveland Art Museum or the Grateful Dead at the Rock Hall. So when they've gotten that relationship, they see what you're posting, 38% of them, they are sharing. Now, that's not to say that you're going to find success every day. And we'll talk about how to, how to maximize that and some what the best days to do that. We'll look at what the statistics tell us. Uh, about the best days and times and words to use so that we can maximize our chance of getting our content shared. So let's talk about what content we might be doing in the first place. So I want to set social media in context so that we're not just going out and, and playing around on Facebook and thinking that if we just start poking people and friending them that, that this is going to be the solution to our social media challenge. We have to look at it in the context of our overall marketing strategy, right? We're, we're using the same colors, the same brand, the same logo, the same names, the same programs, but we're just using an, an additional and unique medium in addition to print and television and everything that we've done in the past. So don't disconnect yourself from everything you've already learned and, the, and what you've, how you've built your brand so far. But let's recognize how this, where social media fits in that, and then bring it into the, the package of things that we're doing holistically. So I want to suggest that these are the five steps that, from start to finish, constitute an effective digital marketing strategy. And we'll talk about how social fits in that. And, and I want to broaden the definition of social media beyond Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. I want to include the email newsletters that you send. And I want to include the blog posts that you have on your website. So uh, let's posit that the very foundation of what we're going to be sharing online starts on the website and starts by having a blog. And I, as I looked at many of your organization's sites, um, maybe half and half, many of you have blogs. Some of you still don't have blogs. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be called a blog. It could just be that you're adding new information about programming going on in the season and you're ensuring that there's video and, and background information about plot or libretto or, or what have you, the cast, bi biographies, and uh, additional information for people to find out about these programs uh, ahead of time. So traditionally, this is thought of as a blog. And, and because there's still some confusion, we'll, we'll talk in more detail about what that is. But the first step is to get content out there. We can start to generate more traffic. Share that on social networks share that content and get a wider audience for it besides the people who are already coming to your website or searching for the content that you're sharing. Next is to get them back to the website. So the reason that we're sending it out into the world, whether we're, we're hoping that Google is going to index it for us or we're putting it out on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, is because we want to get that audience back to our website. That's where we're going to have the best connection and interactivity with them and hopefully capture an email that then we can use for step four, nurturing that relationship, telling them repeatedly and over time what we're doing and how we can interact, what tickets we might have to offer them, what exhibits, what education we have for them. Um, and then we'll talk about how to measure it. Social media, digital marketing in general uh, is unique in that we can measure better than we can all the people that looked at our print ad and hopefully came to our website or, or came to a performance called for tickets. We can measure all this very carefully and clearly um, on the digital realm. So we'll look at some tools that will help us to do that. So uh, and, and by the way, um, 
I just I created this in uh, Keynote on a Mac, and I used a really awesome font. Um, and now it looks kind of blah because that font isn't on this computer. So I just begged your indulgence, and this is really a lot more incredible than than what you're seeing. <laughs> um, so there's there's lots of blogs out there on the on the internet, and and lots of competition for viewership. But there's also lots of people out there searching, and so the idea is that in the coming months and coming weeks and months, if you're creating a schedule that has you regularly posting new information to your website, then you're going to have additional beacons out there, as it were, for people to find through search engines. So as they're looking for information relevant to your mission, then you're creating additional chances for them to find you with each new piece of content that you add to the website. So that's the idea behind blogging. And I still get questions about the origin of, of what a blog is and where that came from. And it just, when, when the idea of a blog originated, it was uh, really meant as a personal journal. And, and still you'll find that a lot is a, a common use for a blog is just to, as, a, as an online journal, diary, personal thoughts and observations. Uh, and it was the word web blog and it just got shortened to blog. And you can really think of it as, as a newsletter. Many nonprofit organizations I find are more comfortable thinking about newsletters. This is more a part of their traditional outreach and sharing items of, of news and, and education. So just think of putting that same kind of content online, hopefully with pictures and, and video where possible. That's the same kind of content. If you flip that around and you're thinking about, again, an overall strategy, if you're planning your, your blog updates on a weekly basis, then at the end of the quarter or at the end of the month, however frequently you send out a newsletter, assuming that many of you do that, you can just take that content and, and summarize it whether it's in print or in an email, and link people back to the site. Say, here's what you may have missed if you weren't paying attention. We've been blogging and, and putting up this great information online. So try not to think about it as, oh, I have to do all this new work, and I get that look a lot. It should be a part of the workflow that you already have established. You're, you're generating content to talk, whether it's in an annual report or other media, newsletters, e-newsletters. So think of that in conjunction with your blog, and this is just the same content, the same articles that you're creating regularly, and just make sure that you're also posting that online for additional opportunities for people to find you and for additional things for you to be able to share online. Blogs are, have proven to be effective, and there's data to back this up. Companies that blog, websites that have blogs, uh, get 55% more website visitors than those that don't. Does that interest anybody to have some more traffic? <laughs> So, so this is a key way to do that. It creates content that you can share on social media as well. So what should we be blogging? I'll offer five benefits of blogging if you're still not convinced. The first is just to keep the site fresh. It's awful to, to who has gone to a website in the last month and uh, it hasn't been updated for a year and you're kind of wondering if, if this organization is even still in existence. Right? So, so keeping it fresh uh, shows that things are going on, that you're active, and that there's, there's something people should be interested in. Uh, as I just said, this can also feed your newsletter content and be a great just part of your, your content workflow of generating articles and news. You reach more people. It, it has an SEO benefit, and that's search engine optimization, and otherwise the more pages that Google indexes from your website, uh, the more it sees your website as a trusted resource and the more opportunities you have for people to link into your site, uh, which is number five. Any questions on these or about what a blog is? Am I, have I lost anyone yet? I want to make sure that we're all still on the same page. A blog is also a good place for multimedia. I don't know if that fits in here. But Absolutely. A blog is a good place for multimedia, Tom said. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, I think 64% of the time that we spend online we are watching videos, not reading text. Okay, so, so multimedia is a great thing to share on your blog, and especially in the arts, um, there's great opportunity for videos, audio, pictures. So that should be a focus of your blogs, definitely. Thanks, Tom. Uh, can I ask you, you know, we didn't used to use the word content in the way that we use it now to talk about what's on the web. You know, content used to mean the thing inside something else, but really use it now to, to mean a 
just anything that can go up on the web to explain a little bit about what constitutes good content? It's a good question. Yeah, so I like to think of it as an article, um, but it could also be a video, an interview. And, and so content then becomes a more generalized word, like a, a thingy. <laughs> you, know, you just want to think of it as, as something fresh that somebody will be interested in reading or watching or listening to that we're adding to the website that provides some educational value. I mean, the goal of all of this is for us to be seen as a trusted resource by the community, by our audiences, so that they want to come back for more and they want to attend our events and, and visit our institutions and partake of, of the arts and, and all that it has to offer. So any kind of, even, and, and it doesn't have to be an epic post. You know, it can be just a couple, three paragraphs that you pull together to just offer a, a, a reflection on something. And we're going to look at, at five different types of content, and hopefully that's going to answer that in more detail to say what kinds of things could we talk about that are going to fill this need. So we might talk about organizational impact, observations on the world around us, or current events. Behind the scenes, I find, is always valuable. Uh, upcoming events is a no-brainer. And how to get involved, whether that's donating or volunteering. Here's an example blog post about organizational impact. San Francisco Symphony visited the home of Mahler in Austria, and they met with his descendants. And how did that affect um, the descendants, how they came and, and did their performance? How did it affect the orchestra members? So a, a great look at what the organization is doing and what it's going to be then bringing back into the community as a result of, of what it's learning on this trip. Observations. This is a, a Rock Hall blog post looking at songs that shaped rock and roll. Imagine, obviously, a seminal piece of art and some reflections on it. Okay, this is the perfect kind of content for the Rock Hall to be offering, and, and it can do that with an authority that few other organizations can. Uh, Opera Cleveland talking about a behind the scenes, going underground, some storage, and just behind the scenes. This is a great thing when it's so often our audience's interactions with us happen between the seat and the stage, and that's as far as it goes. So if we can take them behind the scenes and tell them how things are operating, what goes on with the stage hands and the grips and the flies as well as in the front office, then we can make the case more effectively for the resources that are required, both in terms of people and in terms of money, to keep our organizations running. Upcoming events, again, pretty straightforward. This is a great post of the, this weekend's Alexander Nevsky uh, concert with an excerpt from the film um, and, and all the details you could want about the program. A very clear buy tickets button here. We'll be talking more about calls to action. And uh, getting involved from the Young Audiences blog, talking about a student art contest. Again, profiles of current donors or benefactors or volunteers is another great way to both say thank you and to say, here are the kinds of people who are pitching in to make the organization run efficiently. You could also be a part of, of our operations in this way. What else have I missed that we could be blogging about for your organization specifically? I know we have a lot of different types of, of organizations represented here. Thompson. Those are great thoughts. Uh, interviews are, are terrific reads, as well as you can have it posted both in video form as well as uh, typed out for the search engine benefit of, of all the, the good keywords that will have been generated during the conversation. So those are great ideas. Others? Yes? Trends. Trends. Yep. 
that falls under observations, I think, you know, taking a look at, at what's going on, where things are going, where they've been. This is one of our great privileges as, as educators and historians, my degrees in music history and literature, thinking about how things have developed and, and what that tells us about where we are right now. Nice. Other thoughts? Yes, please. How do you share I think that's terrific. I think all of that's good. Um, especially if you're, I mean, Anything that can help somebody get an idea of, of what that experience is going to be like, of interacting with the organization, visiting the location, what they're going to experience as they walk around, or just helping them to plan their visit and saying, you might want to check out these local restaurants. And, and, and part of that goodwill that you're sending out as a part of mentioning them could come back to you as they recommend to those diners or you know, whatever kind of shop it might be to, to go and, and check out your institution. I think all of that's good. Mm -hmm. Are you going to talk at all about um, commenting on other people's blogs rather than where you're from your own website and people from your own blog to make sure that you get as much We will. And w did you want to add something about that now? No. We can preview it a little bit. No. Let's talk a little bit technical for a minute because I want to talking about the, the things on the website that matter to Google. Because I, I think there's a balance in digital marketing between search engine optimization, making sure that the pages are constructed well so that we're found in searches, as well as um, the, the search objects that we create and how we share things on, on Facebook and, and Twitter, as well as the fact that if we have our pages constructed, they look better when they get shared on Facebook. So some of the things that Google cares about um, and you may just want to make notes of these to talk to, to whoever your, your web lackey is, uh, unless you're that wearing that hat as well. Uh, you know, think about the title tag is important. This is what shows up at the very top of the browser as you're looking for, for a site or in the tab, depending on the browser you're using. This is also what appears when the page gets shared. And Google cares very much what this title is. And, and the keywords that you use in the title are very important to making sure that page gets found as well as the words that are in the URL. You're at a bit of a disadvantage if your, your website is using something like you know, page.aspx question mark ID equals 8743, uh, rather than uh, what, what is known as a, a clean or friendly URL that says you know, clevelandorchestra.org slash concerts slash Beethoven dash violin dash concerto dash josh dash bell. You know. So the more the, the words are clearly in the URL, that also gives confidence to the, the reader, the audience who's going to click on that link, so that they know exactly what they're going to get uh, when they click. So, but G Google cares a lot about that, as well as obviously the words that are in the page are, are, are one of the most important things. Uh, the headings that you use, how you organize the content, your, your paragraph should be grouped, maybe one or two, three at most paragraphs to a heading so that People don't like to read on the web. And the sooner you can embrace that unfortunate fact, uh, the better you'll be able to serve readers by anchoring what they're going to read with images and headings throughout the page. So if you must have a long page of information about something, be sure that you're putting enough images and videos and headings in there to guide the eye toward what they came there for. They likely came there to find out one fact, which could be the time that a performance is going to go on, or they may be doing research for a paper, and they came because you have the best information on Roy Lichtenstein, and they want to know how he felt about dots. Um, you know, Whatever that is, uh, the more you can guide their eye down the page to that thing that they came here for, that the search engine or the, the shared link told them was on this page, the happier they're going to be and the more likely they are to trust you in the future to answer their questions and be a guide for them. 
each image has the opportunity to have alt text in it, uh, which just means that if the image were somehow disabled or not found, or you were using, uh, you were disabled and uh, uh, visually disabled and using a screen reader, this is the text that would get read to you uh, since you couldn't see the image. So that plays a role in search engine optimization as well. Um, links are important. Having content that's not the same as other sites, if you're just copying a page out of Wikipedia and putting it on your site, that's not going to have a lot of benefit. It may get you penalized. So think about what you can say that's new, uh, or at least in your own words. Having frequent updates is good, and having a site map also gets you bonus points from Google. Any questions on the technical stuff? I know we're not here to talk deep tech, but uh, I do see those uh, comments reflected on my evaluations when I don't at least address some technical points. I could talk theory and strategy all day long. Um, so this is where I want to return to talk about what Google values in terms of um, search engine optimization, your search ranking uh, on the search engine results page. And then we'll move on to talk about sharing. So half of what Google cares about is what you say in words on your pages. And the other half is what other people say about you. And you can foster goodwill throughout the online community by also visiting other institutions' pages, reading their blogs, and commenting and saying, hey, I really liked what you had to say about Prokofiev. This is really interesting. Uh, I also have this thought uh, about this particular piece or this era or this country or however you can contribute to that conversation. Um, you're engendering goodwill throughout the web. And as you put out your new content, others are more likely to seek you out and hopefully link to you on their blog. So, Use the opportunity to see what other people are saying, what other institutions are saying about their programs or about artists or genres or ideas that you have in common. Uh, talk about it. Say, hey, I, here's a paragraph that I saw that I thought was really interesting. Here's it quoted. Here's a link to this. And now I'm going to add a paragraph of my own thought about this. What are your comments? Okay, so the social web is a place for you to interact with the audience, not simply to continue pushing things out as we've done in other media, where that's all that we have at our disposal in print, radio, TV. All that we can do is just push stuff out there. Okay? Online, we have the opportunity to interact. So take advantage of that, because that's really what it's about. It's a two-way street, which leads me directly into the social web. Um, the first rule is to listen first. Make sure that you're in tune with what people are talking about. Make sure you're using the same language and not talking over their heads. Again, give that behind the scenes view. Give that preview of upcoming attractions. Get them involved in what's going on so that they feel like they have a hand. In fact, I think that that's the promise of social media marketing, is that instead of having a top-down organization, you're showing yourself to be completely open. You want to invite the grassroots community who cares about your art to be a part of the organization and to help determine the direction that the organization is going to go. And the more successful you are at engaging them on their level and making them feel like they have a stake and a vested interest and a voice in the future of the organization, the more they are going to advocate on your behalf. And then you simply have to give them something that's cool and interesting and that they can take pride in sharing. Uh, my mom, is, as was said in the introduction, is a, a proud member of the Cleveland Orchestra Chorus. And she loves to tell all of her friends about all of the concerts that are going on and all of the, the times that she's singing. And so I imagine that she's getting people in the seats and, and all of the other chorus members as they talk about the concerts with their friends, especially if, if the Cleveland Orchestra has put something on Facebook for, for her to share, she's going to send that right back out so it's visible to all of her network. So by engaging, getting people involved in the organization, reaching out to the grassroots, getting on their level, and giving them something to share, they're going to do that work for you of spreading the word, getting you new fans, and evangelizing on your behalf. And that's really the promise of social media marketing. So some more stats, if you'll indulge me. 
more than half of all U.S. residents and more than three quarters of all U.S. adults are online. How many, what percentage do you think uh, is on Facebook? A lot, we already know. What, give me a number, if you would. 75, anybody else? Sorry? 50? 80, getting closer. 90, getting closer still. 93% of adult internet users are on Facebook. So, so obviously this is going to be our primary target, a pretty astonishing number. Second, we want to understand who these users are. Okay? Regardless of our age, we're networking. So if your stakeholders are still dragging their feet and saying, yeah, but our audience skews older and they're not online, BS. They are there. Okay, we're all, regardless of age, we are social networking. Now, there's a little bit of science involved in getting visible on Facebook. So let's, let's talk science for just a minute. Because Facebook has developed a formula to, to get as relevant as possible to figure out what you are going to want to see. When you open up Facebook, there is a formula behind the scenes that is figuring out exactly what posts from the millions that have been put out there in the last hour, uh, what it should be showing to you, and it's called edge rank. So if we look at it a little bit, this says that it has to do with affinity and weight and date. So users with the strongest connection to the content creator are most likely to see the content in their top news. People enjoy seeing updates from their closest connections. Well, so let's say I have 750 friends. How does Facebook know who my closest connections are? What are your thoughts? People that you look at. Be more specific? Yeah. And, and how does it, might it measure those interactions? What are some of those interactions? Comments, posting on their wall, liking, sharing. What do you think is, might be the strongest type of interaction? Photos. photos are strong. But what are you doing with the photos? Are you sharing it? Are you looking at it? Tagging is good. I would guess that sharing is one of the, strong, one of the strongest connections that Facebook could judge. But we don't know exactly, but we can guess and we can do some, some surveys. And from, from what I've read, I think that sharing is one of those powerful connections that if you're able to get somebody to share, that's the, the very toppity top, uh, the best you can do in terms of creating a, a solid connection with somebody. Below that, maybe commenting, posting on their wall. Anytime you're reaching out and, and touching someone, as it were, um, that's going to show a strength of connection that Facebook is then going to use in determining whether your next comment is something that's going to appear in their feed. Yes? Is this the one you wanted? Mm -hmm. Did you have a question about it or a comment? OK. Um, so as we think about those different types of activities, I want you to also think about the, the content that you're sharing. As you're scanning, and you've, depending on how tall your screen is, right, you've got like I don't know, at least 10 uh, updates that you're scanning to figure out which one am I going to focus in on. And you, so you're looking at update, update, update. What catches your eye? What makes you stop and read something more than others? A picture. A picture. Yeah. Or even better, a video. Yeah, as you're looking at all these posts, the ones with the images are going to catch your eye. And especially if it's a video, something I can click on, spend some time wasting and not doing the other things that I should be doing. Those are the things that are, I'm going to gravitate to. Videos, images, people I know really well because I see their little icon there. I want to give a quick shout out to the Cleveland Orchestra because they've made their um, icon uh, the music director, Franz Belzermust. And so every time I see an update, it feels like the maestro is talking to me. He's giving me the latest news. And I love that. So I think it's even better than a logo is making sure that your personality, your figurehead is right there out front. Because uh, I know that he probably has never 
touched the Facebook page, if he's even looked at it, but I feel like he's talking to me through those updates. So find a way to really connect in, in every way, whether it's just through the iconography, through the type of information that you're sharing. So the, the strength of the connection is our, our first uh, indicator of, of how likely it is that uh, we're going to be, we're going to appear in front of our audience. Also the weight, the more weight Facebook assigns to a type of content, as we just discussed, the more likely users are to see it in their top news. Photos, videos, and check-ins carry a higher weight than comments and likes. So if you can get people to check in at your event, I saw um, a university, I think it was, I'm trying to remember, maybe Indiana University, I don't recall exactly, uh, worked with a marketing firm to actually create these big stands that looked like the little curvy arrows that you see in the iconography on the Facebook app. So they created actual big, tall, four or five foot little pointy arrows to spots at different buildings on campus, encouraging people to check in there so that that would just get people more active through the Facebook page. So you could easily have something right as people came into the box office and say, check in here and you know, talk about the, the play or the musical or the opera you're going to see. That's a great way for people to just see that their friends are going to the Cleveland Orchestra, going to the Cleveland Opera, going to the Rock Hall. Uh, and finally, time decay. Newer content is more likely to show up in top news. Okay, so the type of content, the strength of the connection, and the age of the content all are important factors in whether that's going to show up. And we'll talk later on uh, how to measure all of this and see exactly what's working. Photos are great. I did an experiment once uh, just very by accident. I wasn't even trying to be scientific about it. I just had... Um, found an old yearbook from high school and decided that I would scan in a couple of pages and tag the people that I knew just to you know, share how funny you know, our hair looked and the acne that I had on my face back then. Um, so I scanned in these and I tagged the people I knew. And then they tagged the other people that I wasn't connected with yet in the photos. So it went so much that I decided to go ahead and scan in all the rest of the undergraduate photos from that year. Uh, about six to eight pages worth, I can't remember exactly. And I reconnected, I swear, with at least 100 new high school friends just through that interaction of the viral activity of me tagging someone, them tagging the people that they knew, them tagging the people that they knew, till we were able to really connect through a whole web. So at your next event, your next concert, your next performance, whatever you're going on, even if it's a fundraiser, annual meeting, whatever it is, Get those photos, get them online, tag the people that are already connected to the page, and encourage them to tag the people that they're connected to. And try to expand that web of people who are able to receive the updates that you're sending. So photos are powerful beyond just a, a memory of, of an event. They have the tagging capability that turns it into a viral networking machine. Um, how many of you use Twitter? OK, good, a lot of you. Um, I'm going to go quickly through some of these things about Twitter. I still get a lot of questions about Twitter. It feels, I think the reason that people are less comfortable on Twitter than they are on Facebook is because there's jargon and there's funny symbols. And this creates a, a feeling of, I don't actually feel welcome here unless somebody takes me by the hand and shows me what's going on. Like, like some younger folks perhaps feel at the concert hall, there's all these there's this etiquette and protocol that maybe they're not familiar with. Nobody's brought them in and made them comfortable with all this. So uh, that's my theory, at least, on, on why some people are less comfortable with Twitter. So let's just talk a little bit about what it is. Think of it as a uh, text message that you're sending out that you're copying everybody on. So it's just it's a, a short little message, no longer than, than your typical text message. But it's something you're just sharing with everybody. Uh, I also had somebody say, this reminds me a lot of CB radios. You have a handle, and you put something out there, and there's some jargon to it. There's some code, and you're talking about something you see out in the world. And I thought that was a great analogy. So if you prefer the, the CB radio analogy, um, that could work as well. Here's some Twitter stats for you. Roughly 9% of online Americans use Twitter. That's pretty different 
So why should we care about Twitter when we have 93 of the percent of our online folks on Facebook and 9% on Twitter? What is different about our Twitter followers, do you think? They're younger. They're, they're trendsetters. They're influencers. They're more mobile. That is true. What else? Mm -hmm. How about demographically? There are more other things, too. They're more educated. They have more college, more advanced degrees. They're wealthier. And they're early adopters. They're more mobile, they're more influential. They're more likely to try out new things first and then talk about them. And people are more likely to listen to what they say. Some jargon very briefly for those of you who, again, need a little encouragement to break into to Twitter. Every update is a tweet. If you like somebody's tweet, you can retweet it. Here's a sample tweet. Just a very brief statement and a link. This does the job of getting them to see they want more information about something and click over to the website. Mission accomplished. Here's a retweet. This is kind of old school, actually. Since I did this slide, you'll see that uh, there's now a simple retweet button, which just looks like this. You'll note that even though we're looking at Nicola Ziotti's uh, Twitter profile, these other people have taken up residence here is because she retweeted that. So you'll sometimes, as you're looking at your Twitter feed, see tweets from people you don't recognize. I've never seen a tweet from this person. Well, it's because somebody you do have a connection to has retweeted something they have to say. And that's why you see it there. And it's really easy to, to do the same thing yourself. And it's a good way. You'll, uh, by default, I get an, I, you, you as a Twitter user get an email when somebody retweets something you say. And you think, oh, hey. And you're more likely to retweet uh, something they say or look for an opportunity to do that in the future. So th again, think about how you interact with other organizations and with your fans in looking for opportunities to retweet and know that that will build up goodwill for them to do the same for you in the future. Uh, there's also something called a reply, and this is a direct statement to another account. And this is only visible, this is a, a really private, this is only visible to your the intersection of your followers and their followers. There's also a mention, which means that you're using someone else's name or handle, username, preceded by the at sign which makes it active and a link. Um, but it's not the very first thing in the tweet. Here, it's the very first thing. That means that only the intersection of my followers and their followers will see this tweet. It's a reply. A mention means that I'm just using their name somewhere in there. This is still restricted just to my followers. And there's also something called a hashtag, which is just preceded by a pound sign. If you've watched any TV in the last two years, you've seen this. You watch the debates tomorrow night, you'll see you know, NBC politics in the lower right-hand corner with a little hashtag in front of it. They want you to be talking on Twitter about what's going on using a hashtag that'll identify their network or the show uh, that you're watching. So again, just to reiterate, there's a difference between a reply and a mention. Uh, and a reply sits at the intersection of your followers and my followers if I'm mentioning you. So this is a reply, this is a mention. And if you get mentioned, you'll also get an email by default that lets you know that somebody's mentioned you and then you can take action and go see what it is and, and either solve a customer service complaint or thank them for the great things they're saying, as the case may be. Questions about Twitter? Yes. I think the real difference with Twitter is that you can 
be on it all the time. But I don't think by any means that you have to. Um, this is the difference in, in Facebook, and I'll show you some stats in a minute that talk about the frequency with which you should uh, post to Facebook for maximum effectiveness, um, which is, I'll just give it away, is like once a day or once even every other day on Facebook. Do it more than that, and you start to see a decrease in the likes and comments that you get. Um, on Twitter, you could post multiple times a day without any penalty. People just kind of expect that more on this shorter format um, tool. So, but I don't think uh, that you necessarily have to be on there more for it to be effective. So again, our, our goal with being on social networks, with sharing our content, with creating content in the first place, is establishing ourselves as a trusted resource in our subject matter area. Okay. And so the engagement that we have on a personal level with people as they're in their underwear, in their living rooms, or in their offices, or wherever they have their, have their laptop burning a hole in their legs, it's a very intimate space, and we want to try to adopt a tone, a conversational way that shows a respect for them letting us into that very personal space. Let's, let's talk about how to effectively Facebook and what we can expect from it. This is kind of a, the most sobering statistic that I'm bringing with me today. In any given week, less than 0.5% of Facebook fans engage with the brand they are fans of. Now, Part of that's just the fact that there are so many accounts, and they're nearing a billion accounts now on Facebook. Um, but it also reflects the fact that the, the company, the idea of the company page is an add-on. I mean, it's really intended and began as a place for people, person-to-person -person social networking. So our intrusion into that space as, as marketers and as organizations, as companies, um, is an, is an add-on, and, and you'll see now as you use the mobile app, um, there's any number of featured companies at the top of that scroll. This, they're they're increasing, increasingly trying to find a way to, to profit from companies who want to reach out to their users, but we are something that's added on there. So don't be upset when you only have 150 fans so far and you can't get any of them to like or comment. Even big companies and organizations uh, that have three times your budget um, are still struggling with that. So it, it takes consistency, and I would argue that it's less about how many followers you can get rather than how you can provide valuable information and education um, to the followers that you have, create that quality of interaction. Uh, this is the one I want to just point out briefly to talk about the number of posts per day and the effect on the likes and comments that you'll get. Those companies posting once a day versus as the baseline versus the ones that are posting multiple times a day. You can see with each successive post per day on Facebook, you're going to decrease the engagement that you have. So the more posts per day, the less engagement. We're going to look now at a number of slides that talk about what you should be sharing. We talked about how often. Now we're going to talk about when and what. This little experiment, done by a guy named Dan Zarella that I'll show some data from in a second, he calls himself a social media scientist, and I really like his stuff. You should sign up for his blog if you're interested in, in this, and I'll show his URL in a second. He did an experiment where he put out the exact same picture and the exact same content. If you read this paragraph, Apple has announced that it sold 3 million iPads, it's exactly the same between these two. The only difference is the title. One is positive and the other is negative. And the only takeaway that I have from this is the power of sharing positive information and selling it as such. Okay, so be careful. Your, your title is all important. Same picture, same text, different title, completely different results. Shockingly different results. Okay, positive works. 55 comments on the positive. Nobody wants to touch the negative stuff. Radioactive. Find a way to present your news as positive. Find those positive stories about how you're making an impact in the community. 
So keep it simple. This looks at the difference in Facebook shares from average based on the reading grade level. The lower, the better. Keep it simple. Okay, we start to get too fancy, fewer people are going to share. Verbs are strong share triggers. Adverbs, they confuse us. Adjectives are fluff. Nouns, we need them. Verbs, we love them. The more verbs, the more shares. I shouldn't necessarily say it as cause. The most shared items are heavy on verbs. Weekends. We like to share on the weekends because we're afraid of looking too active when we should be working. Right? Right. Use active language. Invite them to visit or download your content. Join us. That's how it starts. Join us for our final Tuesday evening lecture of the semester. And Tuesday evening is at the modern. Very clear what we're going to get from this and why we should be caring about it. This weekend, see the program that crackled with stylish energy, handles water music. Lots of likes and comments. Make it scannable. We talked about what catches our eye as we go down the page. Using an image, sharing a link that includes a thumbnail, Good. If you, you need to go and test sharing pages on Facebook from your website. And if they're not showing up with an image, then you're not doing it right. There's something wrong with your page. If nothing else, it should be sharing uh, the default logo for the website for your organization at the very minimum. Hopefully, each page has an image on it uh, that's relevant to the specific page that it is, if, assuming it's not the home page, that then will get shared. So be sure to test that out. And give me a call if it's not working, and we'll figure it out. Okay, this is a key to making sure that as you're sh sharing something, it gets seen. Um, bridging the gap between the Facebook interaction and the interaction on the website, there are plugins that you can use on your website. If you already have your website on a content management system like WordPress, for example, it's extremely easy to do this. Um, this is one I worked with a, the news outlet in Youngstown on. Um, so that every article that they posted online, if you added a comment, instead of that comment only living on the website, you would be, it would recognize your Facebook account, assuming you were, had visited it at all recently. Works really well. And then as I add a comment, that not only appears on the website, it also appears on Facebook. So you get visibility in both places, and the conversation can still happen in Facebook without them ever having to visit the website. And as they add a comment on Facebook, it also appears on the website. So this very powerful integration with Facebook comment plugins that connects conversations that are happening on the website and conversations that are visible and invite comment in Facebook itself. So the idea of sharing all this content through social channels is so that we can get leads. Not everybody who visits your website is ready to visit the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or they're ready to buy tickets at the Playhouse Square. Okay? Some need more convincing. So by saying, thanks for reading our blog, give us your email here, that allows you to get an address that you can then, you probably already are collecting email addresses for folks who sign up, attend events, donate, <coughs> buy tickets. Also, try to get those emails from anybody who visits the website, from somebody who just saw a piece of content and liked it and came over and read the blog. Okay? Make sure that's a very clear call to action for whatever it is that you want them to do, which could be buying tickets, could be viewing information about the season. Notice that these are the only orange things on the page, our calls to action. Okay, very clear call to action on the tickets. Make it obvious. Ask for an email. Make sure there's a box that says, do you like our blog? Get free advance notice about guest artists. Whatever it is, 
make sure there's some kind of opportunity for them to get something in exchange for giving you their email address. And then you can follow up with them through email marketing, which is what we're going to talk about next. Any questions about capturing leads, getting people back to your website by sharing online? Any of the stats we talked about in terms of the science of sharing? We'll have some question and answer at the end. So if you've got something you're hanging on to, that's OK. So I want to. we talked about stats on how to share effectively on Facebook. Now I want to talk about email. We've got a list. Now our next job is to continue to feed them information that's going to cement our relationship that's just begun. It's fragile at first. We want to make that blossom into a long-term relationship where when they know that we have a new event coming up, they want to be there and they know about it. So let's talk about how to email effectively. Um, subscribers are more likely to open email after 12 p.m. and the most active hours are 2 to 5 p.m. This is interesting because I think I remember that you're more likely to get a share early in the morning if you're posting something on Facebook. So a little bit of a different this is from uh, MailChimp. They crunched all the numbers on all of their subscribers and all of their clients' subscribers to come up with these statistics. Uh, email opens by day of week. Most emails are sent bet between Monday and Friday. Tuesday and Thursday are the highest volume days. The newest subscribers are your most active ones. They're most engaged immediately after sign up, and then they trail off over time. So you'll see maybe 23% average churn in terms of what you're going to lose over the course of the year. So you've got to be able to beat that rate in sign up to keep your list growing. The more links you have in your newsletter, the more clicks you're going to get, the more opportunities for them to click, whether it's links on photos or in the text or headlines. Sidebar, the better off you are, the more clicks you're going to get. I find that really interesting. I, I don't know that I thought it would be different, but just that's a valuable stat. That really helps you guide your, your approach to crafting that email newsletter and, and how many links that you're putting there. Even if it's the same link and you're putting it in three times, do it so that they're really confident that that's what you want them to do. You want them to find out about next week's ex exhibition. The most important thing you can do with your email audience is find out more about them by trial and error. Segment your audience and figure out what they want from you. Okay? The better your segmentation, in other words, not sending everybody the same thing, but figuring out that these 20 people want more of this and these 40 people want less of it. Um, worked with uh, Panera Cafes to help them create an email list of 50,000 customers in the last two years. And we were able to segment that by the market that they signed up for the list in. Uh, actually, the very cafe that they were sitting in when they provided their email to, to receive special deals and offers. So Panera was then able to very clearly target when there was an event going on at this store, a new store opening up in this one market, they could only send that email to those people in that geographic area and not bother people on the other side of the state uh, with something that would be irrelevant. And that helps ensure that you are trusted and helps increase your open rate and your click-through rate on your emails. So how can we segment? Well. Let's take this email from the San Francisco Symphony that I dug out of my email inbox. And I could look at, again, sorry for the font, uh, I could look at whether they clicked on the Kurt Mazur link or the Itzhak Perlman link or the London Symphony link and know something about what this person might be interested in. That's not to say that I would just put them in a box and only send them stuff about visiting artists if I get them to click on the London Symphony Orchestra. 
but I could know especially that they might have an interest in that. And over time, when I look at the trends, I could figure out that they're more interested in marquee names or visiting artists or they only come to Russian festivals or whatever. So through the process of sending out emails, try to learn and test your audience and figure out what they're really interested in and make sure that you're shifting who you send these lists to. You should have multiple lists, not just one big list. Okay, or multiple segments, additional custom fields. Most of your email programs will allow you to create custom fields that you can then check off as you find that they're interested in, in one thing or another. And most, I, I typically have my clients using eye contact. I th I'm sure Constant Contact has similar functionality. But you can go and s create a custom segment or a sub list from all of the people who opened or who clicked on the last email blast that went out. So use that intelligence to then figure out who you're going to remind about this event. I'm not going to send a reminder about this event to everybody. I'm only going to send it to these people who I know are interested in it so that I don't aggravate these other people and see them just unsubscribe. There's always that risk that you're fighting against, sending too much, sending too little. And there's a constant push and pull and balance. Questions on email marketing? Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. Tax. What is the most efficient way to go about capturing the most important data to get started? Because that to me is very important, but it can be also incredibly overwhelming. Tell me about your organization. Well, I mean, basically, I, I mean, I work for a few, but the mm -hmm. That's hard. Resources are a, a, a fact of life, and constraints are one of those things that tell you how far you can go with this. And right. so, so there's no way that you can, if you're using something like constant contact, there's no way to predispose the program, like say, I'm interested in finding out, to do it proactively instead of retroactively, is what I'm thinking. Is there anything that does that? Um, I think it's just a matter of of strategy. So if I'm, I've, maybe I've got three different types of programs that I run. Okay. And I want to make sure that I'm sending it to, or I, I want to figure out which of my users are most interested in a particular program because then I'm going to hit them up, especially for donations specifically for that program, or just trying to think of a scenario that, that would make sense. So I would go ahead and, and send out a, a notice about a particular program and then take a subset of, take the list of those who opened it. Again, I should be able to just pull that up in constant contact. Give me a list of all the people who opened this one. And then I'm going to send my next notice that talks about how we fund that or maybe a behind the scenes just to that subset um, because maybe my you know requests for donation are what tend to trigger unsubscribes from my list and I want to minimize that. That's an example of, of segmenting your list to make sure you're using it the most effectively. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just thinking how great it would be if you could ask in advance and have it all figured out. Have it sent, sent to you. I mean, like, well, the, like if you're looking for members mm -hmm. of your membership organization, you say, you know, can I get a report for uh, the people that open the email blast 10 times this month? There's nothing that does that. Um, I'd have to go and, and look. There, there may be. Right. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will look at it. I want to emphasize again. Yeah, go ahead. I don't. And then the text version of that newsletter, if you have a lot of links within the body copy, is 
there a proper format for putting them into the text version? So if you, you know, let's say it says emails open on smartphone, and the word smartphone has a link in it. Mm -hmm. When you get to the text version of the HTML, do you put that link in parentheses? I usually do, yeah. Okay. Or just unparenthesized and just right next to the relevant or below the relevant paragraph. Because sometimes it could be quite long and I don't want it to wrap because some older email readers render that then just unusable. So I'll just start it on the next line below the relevant paragraph. You could do that usually just by putting it right next to it, uh, right below it will suffice. I find the number thing confusing. Five minutes? We've got time afterwards for questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, fortunately, we're on the last segment. We're going to talk about measuring. I don't have anything else to say about this except that be sure you're looking at the emails on mobile devices to see how they look because uh, it may be different than how it looks on your desktop. And, and more and more people are looking at the emails that you're sending them on their mobile devices, so be sure you're testing it there and asking friends to test it as well. So how do we measure? Um, I want to just run through some of these tools that are available for you, many of which I assume, how many of you are using Google Webmaster Tools? Okay, all of you really should be. This gives you really valuable information, free, completely free. Just go to this URL and sign up. You'll have to verify that you own the website, but once you do that, um, you'll be able to see any alerts, if there are any problems in your sitemap, which you'll, you'll submit to tell Google all, this is a great way to tell Google all the pages that are on your site so that it knows and you can ensure that it finds all of your content. And it will tell you if it finds any problems, that it can't, by the process that it uses to index content, if it can't find a particular URL, it'll flag that for you and you can fix it. It'll also tell you what people are searching for, how they're finding your site, what keywords it sees so you can make sure that those are in the right priority. and where links to your site are, are coming from. Uh, Google Analytics, how many of you are using Google Analytics? More of you. Okay, all of you should be using Google Analytics as well. You just take, it, you, you set up your site on Google Analytics with your Google account. It gives you a little piece of code. You drop that into your website template and you start to see your traffic over time. How many people do I have visiting the website? How many times have they viewed pages? What's called page views. Um, which will tell you how many pages on average each of them consume per visit. You'll also be able to come to a list of all the pages on your site and figure out what the most popular pages are so you can say that ah, people really like learning about you know, Monet, so we're going to add more information on Monet. Google Reader is a great way to monitor other blogs and know when you should be jumping in on a conversation. Also help see how others are seeing your blog through something called an RSS feed, which usually appears as an orange icon with the letters RSS, a really simple syndication. This is a way for you to track a lot of different websites uh, under one screen and see uh, by whatever is bold and the number how many new articles are available from a particular website. Google Alerts is a great way to, to keep track of what's being said about you or your organization. Google.com slash alerts. It's really easy to set up searches here. And then you can get them delivered right to your inbox on whatever schedule you choose so that you can click on the latest news for your town or your organization or whatever it is. Keep track of your favorite artists. Um, to figure out what's going on on your Facebook site, how many people are seeing your posts, go to facebook.com slash insights and you'll see some great data that's available there. You can also access it just by logging in and going to a particular page that you administer. There will be a little icon that helps you to, to view the stats and insights. Things to, to keep track of as you're managing a page and I encourage you to find all of the people in your organization including volunteers, including board members, not just staff and administrators and the smaller the organization the more imperative this is who can as a team 
work together to moderate the page. Create a schedule for it if you have to, whatever works, but make sure that you've given the ability to post to a whole host of people so that it can be really alive and active and you can catch problems more quickly if, if any do arise. And, and they will from time to time. Um, take a look at the comments that are being said. You're going to have likes. That's somebody telling you they want more of something. On Twitter, this is my next to last slide, what to monitor. Look out for questions that people have so you can answer them. Be looking out for what other organizations that you have partnerships with are talking about. <coughs> people who are talking about your subject matter so you can be a part of that conversation and, and make sure they know you have something to offer. Obviously, you want to track complaints and feedback, but you also want to acknowledge any praise that comes your way. And if you have any questions afterwards, I welcome your, your emails or phone calls. Again, I, I care about what happens with arts organizations here in Northeast Ohio for my own benefit, for my children's, and, and the benefit of the community. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Thanks. Everything was super clear it and was. intelligible. Crystal clear. And I wandered down here with, without a mic, foolish that I am. And the lovely and talented Dr. Catherine Metz, ethnographer extraordinaire, ethnomusicologist extraordinaire. Uh, thank you, Tyler, so much. That was terrific. My pleasure. Thank and, you. And a lot for us to work with. Um, we do have refreshments, light refreshments downstairs at the cafe level, just one floor down, kind of on your way out to continue the conversation. Um, just want to remind everybody, too, if you can help out tomorrow night, at the campaign headquarters for issue 107 on behalf of CAC, CAEC to please make some phone calls to, to help garner support for issue 107. That would be extremely helpful. You can see Judy on the way out. And I hope we can go downstairs and continue the conversation. Thank you very much for visiting the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and for being at today's meeting. Thanks. Oh yeah, get your parking validated, most important thing. I'm gonna see the